Daybreak. Presented by Hannah Murray. Good morning. Joining us on the line now from the UK is Michael Dodd. He's an international speaker and communications coach and the author of Great Answers to Tough Questions at Work. He wrote a a great blog recently talking about Liam Gallagher's interviewing response technique and how he might not be too great at that, but he is good at attracting attention. Uh, We're going to talk a bit about handling yourself in interviews and with the media and whether you can get it completely wrong or whether all publicity is good publicity. Welcome to the show, Michael. Great to wake up with Hannah. Oh, lovely to be with you again. Thanks ever so much for joining us. So, um, Liam Gallagher, he's an interesting character, isn't he? He is, uh, but he does have a, a tendency. It's kind of endearing, and it kind of works with a pop star, uh, to be uh, incredibly grumpy and negative. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't recommend it uh, for other people, uh, particularly those in the business world who are trying to project enthusiasm about what they can offer. But, uh, yes, he does uh, draw you in uh, and is kind of amusing in a very sort of downbeat kind of way. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? Because, as you say, you wouldn't really recommend to anyone to behave in the same way, would you, or to conduct yourself in the same way? No, I think uh, pop star rules when it comes to uh, um, answering questions in interviews and elsewhere are probably slightly different from uh, other uh, parts of the world. And uh, so the particular thing that I uh, focused in on in the interview he gave, and I still wouldn't recommend it even for pop stars really, is that he introduced negatives in a way that left you with some really vibrant, bad images in your head. He was uh, being asked about his uh, infamous uh, bad relationship with uh, his brother, and uh, you know, there were these uh, fellow uh, uh, performer in Oasis before they split up. And he introduced, without being asked, uh, this image of stabbing cats. He, he said, uh, you know, I haven't been going around stabbing, uh, stabbing his cats uh, and hitting his kids. And uh, it was like, well, no one asked if you'd actually uh, stabbed one of Noel's no. cats or, or hit one of his kids. But uh, where did this come from? And negative images have power, and it kind of uh, it stuck in my brain and probably stuck in other people's too. Yeah, absolutely. You'd, you're kind of attracting the wrong sort of attention there, even even though he's saying he didn't do it, to, to kind of get that image in people's head is, is the wrong way to do it, isn't it, really? It is. And uh, in fact, uh, my uh, research team, uh, Miss Google and her friends, uh, checked it out. And he's actually got a record. In fact, both brothers, uh, Liam and Noel, seem to be fond of cats. Uh, I found pictures of uh, Liam with cats and uh, the study with Noel and cats. So uh, Noel obviously he does like cats and Liam appears to as well uh, and so for you know cat lovers wouldn't like to be thinking about that image of stabbing cats so no. I didn't think it worked for him all that well no absolutely so uh, have you worked with uh, people in the um, in the public eye like that before and given them advice on how to conduct themselves Yes, uh, people who have to be interviewed uh, for their business or people who are already in the spotlight and sometimes they're getting uh, tough questions over something and don't quite know how to uh, give the best response. I uh, can work with them and show them uh, various techniques, which work everywhere around the world, actually. Uh, it, they do tend to cross cultural boundaries. And uh, so if you go into an interview and you've been shown how you can give great answers to, to any tough questions that might arise, you can feel a lot more confident and come across in a way that's far more competent uh, than you otherwise might. And is it the kind of thing that once you kind of know these techniques, you can apply them in a lot of situations? That is absolutely true. In fact, uh, I do a lot of work with business leaders groups. Uh, the one in particular that I've mentioned here is one called the Academy for Chief Executives. Uh, and uh, there's other uh, brands as well that I work with. And I started working with them and helping uh, business leaders uh, do uh, better interviews than they uh, were used to doing. And what they said on the whole was, uh, Michael, uh, look, it's one thing to prepare us for interviews, but what we really find at the top of business is that tough questions tend to go to the top, and we get really tough questions from our prospects, from our customers, 
Uh, we often get them from our own teams. We get them from officials. And what we want to do is to be able to apply the techniques uh, to these kind of areas. And they do, in fact, work. Uh, giving a good media interview is slightly different from uh, you know, having a, a tough sales conversation with a potential customer. But there are a lot of aspects which overlap and that's the zone where I can help them a lot in the, the content of what they say. Uh, so they're not introducing negatives like uh, 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 Liam Gallagher. Uh, with the way they structure their answers, and there are ways of structuring answers which really work effectively, whatever the topic, and also the way they look and the way they sound and the way they feel and the image they project as they're uh, answering questions from whoever's asking. Mm. I guess the trick is is always coming across cross um, with a, a certain amount of confidence in that you you've thought about your answer you know what you're saying you know we see a lot of um, certainly with politicians at the moment what's going on in the UK you know people are always trying to catch them out and trying to you know so there's on the back foot and they've got to come up with these answers and often you know they do sometimes come across a bit kind of unprepared or, or look a bit silly or trying to kind of backtrack or changing their mind or you know we see this a lot um, yeah, what, we certainly do. Yeah. What are the sort of tips for, for coming across more, more confident in that way? How can you kind of prepare when you don't know what you're going to be asked? Well, one of the things is, uh, as you say, to be prepared. Uh, and, of course, you don't know what an interviewer is going to ask, absolutely. But you can often guess, and what I try to get them to do beforehand is to focus on the overlap point between all the things they can say uh, and that they could be asked about and what the audience is interested in. And, I mean, you would know as a media professional that while you're asking questions to whoever you're interviewing, you're not asking them so much on behalf of Hannah, you're asking them on behalf of your audience. Mm. And so if people think about it in advance, they can often kind of work out the logical areas that people are going to ask them about. So that's part of it. But the other thing is, uh, and this is where I think a lot of politicians go wrong, uh, and other people as well, is that when they're asked a question and they actually don't know the answer, what they really need to say is why they don't know the answer. There could be a perfectly good reason. It might be something that their research team is working on, or it might be something that involves uh, some confidential interaction, which you know, it would be unethical of them to talk about, things like that. And the trick there is to actually say why you can't answer it, but then to go on and say something which you may not be the answer because you don't know the answer, but say something which is really useful to that audience as close as possible to the topic that you're being asked about so that you are being helpful to the interviewer and helpful to the wider audience. Yes, as opposed to just saying, I can't answer that. <laughs> yes, which a lot of people do. Or, or in fact, you know, if you take, uh, and I'm sure your uh, uh, listeners have been following it a bit, you know, the various questions being thrown at Boris Johnson about his private life. Yeah. And, yeah, he's kind of saying, I won't answer them. I, I won't answer them. But he's not really spelling out uh, why he won't answer them. Uh, I mean, there are very good reasons that he occasionally hints at. Um, and, and, you know, it's probably perfectly reasonable for people to have a private life if you explain it in the right kind of way. But if you just sort of uh, take this attitude of, uh, you know, won't or can't answer without anything else, you come across as very unhelpful. And that's where a lot of people in the business world and elsewhere can improve their game uh, and come across as far more useful, likable, helpful, etc. Um, you know, just by trying to help the audience. And that's what great answers are often all about, is actually being as helpful as you possibly can be to that audience. Mm. Uh, one of the things you talk about in the blog that I mentioned is this kind of man bites dog story. What does that mean? Well, that's a uh, journalism term, and I do teach journalists sometimes, and I, I learned this when I was uh, uh, studying uh, journalism in Australia, Yeah, is that it's one of the most basic definitions of news. There's all kinds of things which you know, your team would be uh, you know, deciding upon when they decide what should go in a, in a news bulletin and what should be left out. But 
the man bites dog thing is often a good test because, you know, if there's a story about a dog biting a man, uh, particularly if it's a postman or something, it's probably not news because, you know, it's too common. Uh, you know, we know that uh, the dogs bite postmen unless it's a particularly ferocious attack or the dog is owned by a celebrity or something. Uh, so that's not news. But if a, if a man bites a dog... It immediately asks the question, you know, why did he bite the dog? You know, what's going on? Uh, and, you know, it's unusual. So what makes the news bulletins, you know, to a certain extent is the unusual. And that's when it comes to planning your answers. If your company is doing something that's a bit unusual but interesting, then that's often a good thing to gravitate to in an interview. Yeah, absolutely. You want to do something different, don't you? You want to stand out. Yes, so, you know, uh, a dog bites man doesn't stand out, man bites dog does. I mean, mm. I, I almost sound here a bit like Liam Gallagher about stabbing cats, and I don't want to encourage <laughs> that. And so I'm not suggesting that you try to uh, get publicity by biting dogs. Uh, not a good idea, and not good for anyone, including the dogs. But you often uh, find that uh, when I'm working with companies, that they actually are far more interesting, and they're doing more interesting things than they let on. I particularly find it with accountants. I work with quite a lot of accountants. And accountants, uh, when you meet them, uh, particularly in a group, they often say, oh, we're just a bunch of boring accountants. We don't do anything interesting. When you probe, uh, often you find that, well, actually, they are doing interesting things uh, in a way that, uh, you know, are a bit unusual. And, uh, and you know, they, they're working with particularly interesting companies. They may not be able to name them, but they can often name, you know, aspects of what their clients do. Uh, under certain circumstances and you want to get them to gravitate to the fascinating territory not the dull territory mm. and that's part of it and if you plan that ahead it's so much easier yeah that that all helps in terms of publicity doesn't it if you're talking about well whatever you're talking about as you say whether it's accountants or if you're interviewing a, an author if you like or if you're talking to someone who's got a um a tv program or whatever it is if someone's looking for publicity for something it's trying to find a, a sort of hook trying to find something that's got a, that makes people go oh, that's all you know makes their ears prick up Absolutely. Now, I don't uh, preach that any publicity is good publicity uh, because that's a dangerous territory to be on, even for pop stars and, uh, and authors and other people who want publicity. Mm. But if you can actually be clever, do a bit of advanced thinking and think, well, what is this person or what's the audience uh, listening to this uh, particular journalist? What will particularly fascinate them and make sure that you head for that territory? Then you're doing everyone a favor. Yeah. Fascinating. Well, if people want more information, there's a, um, a great book that you've done called Great Answers to Tough Questions at Work. And uh, they can also have a look on your website, can't they? There's lots of information on that. They can. In fact, if they're really keen, uh, they can uh, sign up to uh, getting uh, editions of the blog that you mentioned. Uh, oh. If they go to uh, www.michaeldoddcommunications.com, uh, you can actually have the opportunity to get uh, my comments about hot communications issues and uh, tips to help people uh, in their uh, communications at work. Mm, fantastic. michaeldoddcommunications.com. Michael, thanks ever so much for joining us. Great to chat. Splendid to talk with you, Hannah. Have Thank a great you. day. Thank you. Bye-bye.